Okay, this is uh, Walter Kurtz, and I'm here as a representative of the Historical Committee of the Bar Association to interview Ashley Wilkshire, the, the now retired but longtime uh, director of uh, legal aid, about uh, his involvement in legal aid here in Nashville and the history of uh, legal aid here in Nashville. So, uh, Ashley, why don't you uh, start off? and uh, tell us uh, a little about your background, where you were born, and uh, your education, and first of all, how you ended up in Nashville. Well, I was born in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, went to uh, public high school there, and then went to college at uh, Washington and Lee in Virginia. Uh, and then after that, I went to uh, Union Theological Seminary in New York. I had all through college, uh, not sure if I wanted to be a minister or, or a lawyer, and uh, I uh, decided to go on to seminary, and I did, and I uh, uh, finished seminary uh, then in 67. And then I went overseas uh, for two years as a journeyman missionary uh, and was in Bangkok. Uh, in, in Thailand, and uh, while I was there, decided well, maybe I wanted to be a lawyer after all. That. I think the, the deciding experience for that was that during the summer of 1966, I had gone uh, with uh, a group uh, to work in southwest Georgia. Uh, on something called a student interracial ministry. It was sort of uh, a, a minor uh, part of the uh, civil rights movement uh, in Albany, Georgia. And uh, I did some work there teaching in the Head Start program and uh, doing some other things. And, and uh, there were also at the same time not only seminary students there but law school uh, students, uh, and they were working with a local lawyer uh, named C.B. King, and uh, during the summer it just impressed me that the, that the law students and the lawyers were getting a lot more done than we were, uh, and that this might be uh, a more uh, effective way to uh, work uh, on the issues of, of that day. And so I thought about that, I mean, but I went on back and finished seminary, and uh, then I went overseas. And uh, while I was overseas, I would read in the uh, international edition of Time magazine. I don't know if you got that when you were in Vietnam, or maybe y'all got the American version. We got, we, it was printed on tissue paper, and, and practically. And, and uh, I would read in there about the uh, I remember the California Rural Legal Assistance and the work they were doing uh, in the poverty program uh, in, in California. And I thought, boy, I, that's, that's what I want to do. And so I started applying to law schools and, and uh, uh, ended up at Vanderbilt. So what particularly attracted you uh, to Vanderbilt and to Nashville? Well, uh, I... I was sure I wanted to come back to the South. Uh, I was committed to living and working in the South. And so I only applied to law schools in the South. Uh, I, I don't remember, I, I remember I applied to UVA and Duke and Emory and Vanderbilt. And uh, by the time uh, I left, Thailand, I guess the only one I had heard from uh, was, uh, was, was Duke that turned me down. It, maybe I had heard from, from Vanderbilt that I was on the wait list. Um, and so as we were traveling back, Susan and I got married in, in, in Bangkok and then uh, were coming traveling back and we were in Isfahan in Iran and got a message from my mother uh, that I'd been accepted at Emory 
And so, you know, I sent them a postcard or whatever and said, ah, I'd like to come there because it's the only place I'd heard from. Then we got to Athens and we got a message from Susan's father saying that he lived in Lubbock, Texas. And I'd never met him. Uh, hadn't, you know, I'd only met one member of her family and that was her brother John. And uh, the message was to call him. And uh, we thought somebody had died or some problem. We call, uh, called him or somehow I got in touch with him. And he told us that I had been accepted at Vanderbilt. Uh, and, you know, how he learned that uh, was sort of an interesting story. Uh, that summer, and that's the summer of 69, uh, apparently Dean Wade was visiting in, uh, in Lubbock to help Texas Tech get uh, started its law school. And, uh, and there was a write-up about Dean Wade in the, in the Lubbock Avalanche Journal. And so Susan's father, Frank, uh, got the idea that he would get Lucille, Susan's mother, to call up Dean Wade and his wife, who were there for the summer and staying in a hotel, and uh, invite them to dinner. And uh, so they did, and the Wades came. And apparently during the dinner, uh, Frank mentioned that he had this erstwhile son-in-law that he'd never met who was on the waiting list at, at Vanderbilt. And uh, the next day, apparently Dean Wade called back and said, uh, oh, I called Nashville this morning and found out that he's off the waiting list. We had some openings, and, and uh, he's now accepted. So that, that's how I had, you know, I was really interested in Vanderbilt because in the catalog that I'd gotten uh, in Thailand, it listed that they had courses in poverty law and they, uh, in, in racial justice, and, and Ted Smedley taught a course on church and, church and state that I was really interested in. And, and uh, they, they published a law relations journal uh, there at the law school. And uh, of course, I got here, and, and none of that was happening at, at, at by then. Uh, but anyway, I was happy to be here, and we've, we've enjoyed being in, in Nashville. It's been a wonderful place. Now, when you were a Vanderbilt law student, I think you got hired as a law clerk at legal aid then called legal services and then you your your career started from there tell us how you got your connection with legal aid and got on as a law clerk and when did that happen yeah well my first year uh in in law school yeah I, obviously i wanted to do poverty law or something like uh, civil rights or something and uh and so I sent out all these applications for a summer job. And uh, I remember in particular, I sent one to the Law Student Civil Rights Research Council and, uh, and said I wanted a job, uh, particularly in, in Appalachia. I thought that's where I should work. And uh, I didn't hear from them and didn't hear from them. And then I decided, well, you know, they're offering these stipends, but if I offer to work for free and say, Susan, at that point was teaching at Fisk and, and making what for us was a lot of money. She was making $12,000 a year. And so I wrote to him and I said, you know, I'll come work for free. Just let me come work in these poverty law projects in Appalachia. Still didn't hear a thing. So in, in, I guess it was in the 1st of April uh, in 1970. Uh, I just came downtown to the to the Stallman building on the sixth floor and met with uh, Jerry Black and uh, I he he hired me as a as a clerk and uh, so I came to work starting the first of June uh, 1970 the same day uh, Dave Tarpley came because he was a year ahead of me in law school but uh, we we started on on that day. So you retired uh, as director many years later in what year? 2007. Yes. So you were there from 1970 uh, to 2007. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, um, then uh, what year did you graduate from law school? 
Uh, 72. And uh, then you became a staff attorney at Legal Services. Yeah. Um, and then how did that progress into you becoming uh, director? Well, as you remember, uh, we had some sort of tumultuous times there uh, with the administration of the, of the uh, organization. Uh, went through two or three directors after, but you came in September of 70 uh, as, as a clerk. And, uh, and then we graduated in 72 and, and were there. And what, there were three different directors, one after another, within the course of two or three years there, or actually several months. And uh, then what, you became director in 73, the year after we finished law school. And then what, in, uh, in 76, you decided to go teach at UT in the clinic uh, and so I applied for the position, and then I, I became director in, uh, what, February, February 1st of 1976. Okay, well, we're going to come back to that uh, later as we talk about your career at Legal uh, Aid and also what Legal Aid did, but why don't we take this opportunity, because you've done a little research, and go back and have you talk about the history of legal aid here in Nashville, when it was founded, how did it get going, and, it's, and, and how did it, it, did it in its embryonic state uh, before even you came in 1970? Yeah. Well, we, we were the, sort of there uh, for uh, close to the beginning, but it wasn't the beginning. I, I think the the uh, first, well, let, let me say this, in, in the early 1900s, uh, in the minutes of the National Bar Association, there are sporadic references to a legal aid society or a legal aid bureau. It was sort of a volunteer thing. And I, at, at one point, in, it, it was suspended for World War I, uh, I guess, uh, and, and then it came back and, and uh, but it, it looks, just looking at the little material that I've found, it looks pretty sporadic, and obviously it was a, a mostly a volunteer thing. They may have, may have had a secretary uh, from time to time that would uh, help coordinate things. But uh, I know at one point, I remember Tommy Smith saying, and others, that they would uh, come over to the courthouse, this is, this is in the 50s and 60s, and, and uh, lawyers would come on Wednesday afternoon and, and sort of interview people and, and give advice. So there had been sort of some legal aid effort by the, by the bar. So then in 65, uh, you remember that was the time of Lyndon Johnson's presidency and his war on poverty. And uh, there was established the Office of Economic Opportunity, the OEO. And, uh, and then there was established within OEO an Office of Legal Services, which was formed to fund uh, local legal aid programs and both existing programs like there were in Atlanta and Chicago and New York and places like that, and to encourage folks to start new ones. And uh, so that was sort of coming online, and the ABA had gotten behind it. Lewis Powell was the president of the a ABA, and he and others uh, were working with Sergeant Shriver uh, in, in OEO to, to sort of bring this thing to fru fruition. And so the, the Bar Association here formed a, formed a committee and, uh, to look into this thing. In the meantime, I, I know there was an article in, uh, in the Tennessee Bar Journal uh, that the executive director and a lawyer from Memphis, I don't know who they were, wrote entitled A2 Brute, uh, saying that the lawyers had been stabbed in the back by, by the ABA and by the uh, OEO for, for establishing this uh, legal aid business and, and uh, involving lawyers in all this government business and it was compromising the attorney-client relationship and all this kind of business. And so this committee reported back to the 
to the Nashville Bar Association board that, that the bar just ought to stay out of all this. In the meantime, several things were happening. One, Lewis Pride kept writing letters and encouraging people, he was a lawyer uh, here in Nashville, uh, to, to do this, that th this was an important thing to do. And uh, also, the Community Action Program, which was sort of the OEO uh, administration uh, group here in town, headed by Pascal Davis, uh, they applied for the grant uh, for uh, the legal services. And uh, George Barrett and several lawyers in his office and others, I know incorporated a group called Target Area Services. And uh, George says that the Teamsters were somehow involved in it. And I, I haven't seen the paperwork on that, but I have seen that uh, the corporate papers uh, on that. And uh, so there were these other potential grantees out there. And so the, uh, Lewis Pride wrote a letter to Woody Sims, who was the new president of the Nashville Bar Association. And Woody reconvened this committee headed by Reber Bolt, and Tommy Smith was the secretary, uh, to restudy this thing. And so they did, and uh, then came back and recommended uh, to the uh, to the bar board, uh, I think late in '67, uh, that this is something we ought we ought to do. The bar board then said, "Well, but we need to have a referendum on this." So they they had a referendum for all the lawyers, uh, and it passed 206 to 171, I think. Uh, and so. Then uh, the bar board incorporated this legal services of Nashville, uh, and the, the, uh, the then appointed a board of directors for legal services, and, and Harris Gilbert uh, was then the first president of, of the board. Uh, and then as director, when you, you were director, and any director of uh, legal aid, or as it was then called legal services, were responsible uh, directly to the to the board to the board yeah. and uh, the board uh, was appointed by the bar board well the first one was uh, after that I mean it, it elected uh, its its own members uh, and so it was sort of a rotating uh, board and in those in that in that first year did some really significant uh, work in informing this thing uh, and found out just soon after they were formed uh, in 68 that OEO had run out of money and they weren't going to get any money. And so they formed a fundraising committee headed by Dr. Hill, who had been president of Peabody College, and Dogan Williams, uh, one of the Methodist Church, uh, one of the Methodist churches in North Nashville as a head of this, and, and they raised uh, $25,000, $26,000 to get the thing going, and uh, then at the, somewhere at the end of 68, OEO found the money, and, and it was one of the last uh, legal aid programs funded by OEO before the 68 election when things sort of changed. Now, describe for us when you came in 1970, uh, where were the offices located, uh, and how many lawyers and staff, or how, how big was the office? It's, uh, it was on the sixth floor of the Stallman Building, 615, uh, and there was a director, John Corbett, uh, and it looks like there were actually three, four uh, staff lawyers. Uh, I remember one was named... Well, Jerry Black, black, green, and gray, uh, gray for gray, uh, and uh, and I'm not sure how long any of those stayed or didn't stay. There was also a, a woman named Karen Ennis who was there for a little while. Uh, I don't know if R. B. J. Campbell was there at that point. I know R. B. J. had been a member of the that committee in both iterations of that committee chaired by Reba Bolt. R.B.J. Campbell had been a, been a part of that. Uh, and then he was on the staff at Legal Aid, I think, when, maybe when we were there. 
so there were at least those those people there. Some of them, I think, on a on a separate grant that uh, Reginald Heaver Smith grant. I know that Grayford Gray was. Uh, so there were there were three or four lawyers there, and and then a bunch of us law students. So. Now the the function of then legal services and legal aid is to provide uh, uh, services to uh, indigent people in, in uh, civil cases. Um, what in those uh, early days you were there uh, in the 70s, um, how would you describe the, the caseload? I mean, what, what were the staff attorneys doing uh, to, to fulfill their function? Well, always one of the one of the tensions uh, in legal aid, I, I, I think from the beginning of, of the OEO uh, assistance in, in 1965 was a question about uh, volume and impact. Volume, you know, do we just run through as many cases as we can or do we try to do cases that have a wider impact on more people? It, essentially prioritizing uh, the problems. Uh, uh, the, you know, do we do name changes and uncontested divorces, or do we do, you know, custody cases where there's domestic violence or whatever? You know, ha how do you? And so, at that point, as I remember, we were just doing everything. I mean, it, it was it was the whole thing from from soup to nuts, and uh, I mean, we were involved. In, uh, Rita and Paul Geyer. Uh, were there in uh, what 70, 71 and 72 um, and uh, I, I remember I mean one case Dave Tarpley was involved in this too the Harding versus Doyle uh, where the General Sessions judges were uh, putting people in in jail when they could not afford to pay uh, Metro fines if you if you didn't pay them $25 or whatever it was then they'd Put you in jail, and uh, so uh, they had to file a lawsuit to stop that practice and file a lawsuit in federal court suing all the general sessions judges. And of course, that didn't make the organization very popular uh, with the judges. And uh, you know, there were a number of uh, cases like that, but it, it was just it was a different day. I remember one of the judges in the general sessions. Uh, saying in response to one of the lawyers uh, who had cited a Supreme Court case that said you couldn't do this, uh, the judge said, well, listen, Judge Berger can run his court up there in Washington however he wants, but we're going to run our court down here the way we want. And so it was, it was a difficult time. Well, and uh, did, uh, and then you became the director in, um 1976, um, and we'll discuss more about the cases, but um, w why don't you speak about the, uh, the growth of the organization, both with staff, uh, funding, and geography over, over your tenure? Well, soon after I became director, uh, I guess I was became director in February of '76. Then, the next year, uh, you remember Jimmy Carter had been elected, and and uh, so it the the atmosphere started changing in in terms of the federal government's attitude toward legal services and. And there was a guy named Tom Ehrlich who was head of the Legal Services Corporation in, uh, in Washington. And he set a goal of trying to extend legal aid to you know, everybody in the country. Uh, at that point, there was legal aid in only four counties of Tennessee. I mean, Nashville, Chattanooga, Knoxville, and, and, uh, and, and Memphis were the, were the only ones with legal aid. And so, he did get some increase in funding, and so we started. We we then got some of those funds and and expanded the services to uh, uh, to open an office in Gallatin and and one in Murfreesboro, and uh, that was not altogether 
uh, easy. Uh, I tell you a story about uh, uh, going up to Gallatin. Uh, I'd, I'd go to the towns and, and meet with the bar association, uh, and yeah, it was sort of a mixed. Uh, remember, this is only you know, what ten years after Nashville was going through the same thing. Uh, and so it was sort of a mixed reception. Uh, this one, particularly in, in Gallatin, I got up and went out to some nice country club. Charlie Bone took me. Uh, he was a young lawyer at the time, too. And, uh, and we, we had this meeting, and, and I, I gave him a little talk about legal aid and, and what it was. And, uh, and, yeah, and at, at the end, we'd have questions and, and whatever. And uh, so the first thing that happened after I talked was some guy stood up in the back and said, there he is, boys, there he is. I told you this was going to happen, and there he is. You know, I'd, I'd, I assume that was sort of the, the outgrowth of that attitude of A2 Brute, and, and you know, we, they're going to socialize the practice of law, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're done in by the federal government and all this kind of business. And so... So, uh, but now that I have to say that two people really stood up for me in a nice way, and one was uh, was Charlie Bone, who had who had taken me to the meeting, uh, who later was head of the fundraising campaign for all of Legal Aid in, in I think 2009, uh, now practices in Nashville, uh, and Ernest Pellegrin, uh, who later became a, a judge and whose son, John, was then on the board of Legal Aid for a long time. And they, they said, well, the guy who stood up in the back of the room, I later, I then found out afterwards, was uh, Judge Boyers. This is the older Judge Boyers. Uh, and, uh, and he, you know, obviously, and, and the lawyers up there initially uh, had a little bit of a hard time. I mean, they, it, it may not have been, you know, an easy place to work, and, and, you know, they would, I remember some people would say when they were going to court, there go those Russian lawyers. Uh, and so the reception was not all together great, but, but the lawyers really worked on, on improving their relations with people. One was Andy Shookoff, and the other was Steve Palovitz and Deborah Dickinson. And... Uh, and after two years, we had a reception at the, at the office and invited members of the bar to come and judges and whatever. And Judge Boyers, this was, uh, this was in 1977, 78, uh, Judge Boyers came up to me and he said, I just want you to know that these lawyers you sent up here have done a fine job and I think that we've got good relations in the bar, and it's because of these fine lawyers you sent up here. And so it was wonderful to have that uh, sort of affirmation uh, there. Um, so we opened those offices in 77. and uh, Gallatin and Murfreesboro. Gallatin and Murfreesboro. And then in 79, we opened an office in Clarksville. And I'll tell you a story about that, too. I went up there to speak to the Bar Association. I remember walking down the street, going to the Bar Association meeting, and uh, this lawyer, very nice lawyer, very good lawyer, uh, and we later became friends, and, and, uh, but we were walking down the street on the way, and, and he had, you know, it was a group of lawyers, and he and I were sort of in the back, and he said, well, this may be all right, he said, but i tell you what, th this thing, up here in Clarksville, we got our own way of doing things, and we, we don't care what it is from Nashville. We don't want anything from Nashville. We don't want any Nashville banks. We don't want any Nashville lawyers. We don't want anything from Nashville up here. Uh, he said, if we were having a picnic on the 4th of July, and somebody was giving away ice cream, and they said the ice cream came from Nashville, we wouldn't eat it. And so, but anyway, we opened the office. And, uh, you know, of course, now all their banks are owned by, most of their banks are owned by people in North Carolina or whatever. But, but uh, so that, that was, uh, the, those 14 counties 
uh, were, uh, were it until 2002. And what happened there was that, that uh, there was a president of the Legal Services Corporation in Washington. And by this time, the, the federal funding was only about a third of our funding. I mean, we had about 30 different sources of funding, including a very nice local fundraising campaign uh, that had been started by Charlie Warfield in, in 87. Uh, but, uh, but it was a significant part of our funding, and they, this guy uh, had the idea that there were, not, there were then eight legal aid organizations in, in Tennessee, and it was the same in most places around the country. And this guy decided to be more, I think he was a corporate lawyer from Seattle, and he was, had this job. He believed in consolidations and mergers. And so he put a condition uh, on our funding that we had to uh, consolidate. And uh, we resisted it for two or three years as long as we could. Uh, and then um, I remember Bob Cooper in a, in a board meeting saying, well, let's talk to those people in Oak Ridge. That's a pretty good organization. And if we've got to, you know, consolidate, let's, let's consolidate with them. And, uh, and so we did, and, and we ended up merging. And then the Legal Service Corporation said we had to uh, also take over Columbia and Tullahoma. Uh, and we did, and we got some good lawyers uh, out of that. And so we ended up then uh, with a very large area that we were serving in Middle Tennessee and on the Cumberlands. And, uh, and, and changed our name to a rather long and involved Legal Aid Society of Middle Tennessee and the Cumberlands, uh, and had eight offices then uh, across Tennessee. So it, it grew into a pretty big operation. So by the time you left, you ruled over an empire. No, well, I, I can't say that. Now, but how many it, counties did it did it cover? Yeah, I ought to be able to just tell you that off the top of my head. Was it? I don't know. It was, but it went from Oak Ridge. Uh, from, in the from the Cumberland Gap to the Tennessee River. And I used to know that number right off the top of my head, but I, 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 of course. But. Well, and finally, how many lawyers were employed in this? Well, there were 33 uh, at the most, but uh, the fact is that in 1980 and 81, we had had 33 lawyers in just Nashville, Gallatin, Murfreesboro, and, and Clarksville. Then, of course, the, the big cuts uh, came to the Legal Services Corporation under Ronald Reagan and, uh, and Ed, Ed Meese, uh, who really didn't like legal aid because of uh, legal aid had represented uh, migrant workers in, in the, the legal aid in California had. And uh, so the, at that point, we had had 33 to serve you know, just 14 counties, and now we had this whole swath of area, and we had 33 lawyers. Well, let's go back to the 70s when you were describing for us um, when legal aid, then legal services, took all sorts of cases yeah. and included uh, doing these class action cases having to do with uh, you know, access to the courts or uh, government benefits. Um, how was the, how, how as, as time moved on during your tenure, uh, how was your case law load affected by A, your resources, and two, uh, restrictions placed on you by government regulation? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the, yeah, the, the managing the case load was always an issue. Um, I, I remember one of the things I did uh, when uh, uh, I'd been to some conference or something, you, you were the director, uh, and I guess by that time we had segregated off consumer law, Dave Tarpley was there, or maybe, maybe this happened at the same time, what I'm about to say. I came back and said, 
Walt, we got all these lawyers complaining about having to spend so much time in domestic relations court. And, you know, that every day it's, you know, somebody or another person and, and it's just wearing out everybody. I said, give it, give it to me and I'll be the family law section. And it was me and uh, Pat Hilton and I think one other person, Gail Squires came uh, soon after that, who had clerk, uh, who'd been a, a, a clerk for Judge Trimble. And so we took on the, uh, on the family law, and that, that was really an effort to, to sort of manage that caseload. And then, then I think at the same time, Tarpley just sort of concentrated on uh, consumer law. And so that was sort of the beginning of any specialization uh, at Legal Aid, which over the years, obviously with more resources, we developed a little better, having different sections in the office to do, do different things, and that, that helped a lot with the efficiency, because you, know, you, you sort of specialize and, and do, do things that you're familiar with uh, every day instead of going off one day and doing one thing and another day another. Um, but then in terms of uh, you know, what cases we did and all that business, um, there, there always was this, this pressure uh, in Congress uh, and in some administrations to limit what people, lawyers could do uh, who were funded uh, by Legal Services Corporation but with these federal money. And they were always trying to tie uh, strings to it. And this was particularly bad uh, during the during the Reagan uh, times when there were limitations on what we could. And then it, it uh, the, sort of the, the culmination uh, came with the 1994 congressional uh, elections uh, when Newt Gingrich uh, had the control of, of, the, of the House. And uh, at that point, I mean, our, our funding in the early 80s had been cut substantially. And then at this point, uh, it was cut, uh, again, I think 25% uh, from the money we got from the federal government. And they added about 14 restrictions on, uh, saying we couldn't do legislative and administrative work, uh, which we had done uh, quite a bit of, and, and some pretty effectively. Uh, so you couldn't do that kind of advocacy that lots of law firms do and have people uh, specifically in sections to do that. Um, and you can't handle any class action lawsuits. Um, so now legal services all over the country or legal aid had been uh, sort of notorious for its class action lawsuits um, affecting government policies. Yeah. So that came to an end that you, you could not do that anymore. Yeah, we had, to, we, we had to make a decision. If we were going to keep on taking money from the Legal Services Corporation, which, as I say, at that point was about a third of our budget, uh, then we were going to have to stop doing that. Now, the truth is Frank Block was the president of the board at that point, and we, and we had this, you know, we, we were always having these uh, meetings, uh, this, uh, this may have been called the Doomsday Committee or something like that, but, but uh, you know, what are we going to do, what are we going to do? And so, as Frank pointed out, the class action and then legislative stuff was about 5% of our cases. And, you know, we still had the other 95% that we had, you know, responsibility for. Um, and so the end of that was we decided to keep on taking uh, the federal money. Uh, and Gordon Bonneman and Michelle Johnson decided to leave and go start the Tennessee Justice Center. Uh, and so what happened was that, you know, they had to make a decision. They were involved in several big cases involving health care and uh, had been for some time. 
uh, and Gordon had done lots of other class action cases, as, as had a number of people on our, on our staff, but uh, they just, they made the decision, a quite brave decision, to just essentially go out on their own. Well, that brings to mind two questions, though. But prior to 1994, what uh, were, would be the class action cases that you recall of, of the most import done by Legal Aid? Boy, they, there, there were lots of important ones. I mean, I, I think of uh, Gordon's case on, on the, on the prison and the con prison conditions, uh, which went on for a long, long time, uh, from the mid-70s to the early 80s, or, or mid-80s. Uh, I think it went through three commissioners. I mean, the, Gordon sort of became the, the institutional history of the corrections department uh, as these uh, different commissioners was cycling in and out. One of, and one of many of the cases would start out uh, as debt collection cases, say. Uh, a woman got sued by Vanderbilt Hospital for a, uh, for a bill, uh, and she couldn't pay it, and uh, came to see us, and Gordon called up the lawyer who was doing the collection case and, and said, you know, this lady really can't do this, and don't y'all have an obligation under the Hill-Burton Act to, because y'all got money from the federal government, aren't y'all supposed to do a certain amount of, of uh, charity care? And uh, you know, the lawyer and his client essentially said, no, and not, you know, we're not gonna do it for her. And so he, actually he, he had to go then file an action in federal court to stop the collection action against uh, against her uh, and ended up with an agreed order years and years later uh, where Vanderbilt agreed to do a certain amount of, of, of charity care. I mean there was the one that uh, that you were so much involved in and in, in, uh, the Seville case having to do with conditions at uh, Clover Bottom Hospital and uh, the way you know people were not getting any treatment and were just being held there uh, which resulted, of course, in uh, our getting threatened with disciplinary action uh, because we were representing uh, these people at Clover Bottom uh, without permission of their guardian. Uh, they were incompetent and so they needed to have a guardian. Well, the guardian was their state, was the state, and it was the state that was mistreating them. And so we got a complaint filed against us for representing these people without permission of their guardian, right? And, and then the Bar Association appointed a committee that unanimously recommended that we be disciplined. Uh, and then, uh, thanks to Brad Reed's uh, stalwart uh, defense of us, he was then president of the board, uh, and the guy from Philadelphia, Jerome Shestack from the American Bar Association Commission on Mental Health, intervening as well, then the bar board voted not to discipline us uh, for that. Uh, but it, so, so that, was, that was one. Yeah, I was involved with a, a, a case uh, that had to do with the residency requirement uh, before you could get help from Metro General Hospital. Uh, Tarpley and I uh, filed, filed this case on behalf of this woman who'd been here for some time, uh, and there was a, a, a residency, I forget whether it was a six months or a year or, or whatever it was, uh, that you had to be here before you could get help. And so, you know, we had to deal with that. And then, then we had those uh, whole series of cases uh, against, the, uh, against the welfare commissioner, Fred Friend, uh, that uh, had to do with his illegal administration of the, of the department and not giving people what they were supposed to get. Well, the second part of my question, though, was the other side of what you described, the choice in 94, which 
is the the 95 percent mm -hmm. because it strikes me that the five percent would get legal aid in the headlines yeah, yeah. but it's the 95 percent of the cases that you kept that is the nuts and bolts of legal aid yeah. and uh, where you help the individuals and w why don't you describe those cases i mean well there several categories, health, uh, housing, benefits, consumer, and family law. And today that, that means domestic violence cases. Uh, you remember when we started practice, there was no such thing. I mean, we didn't know anything about domestic violence. I mean, it, it, that was just not a category that was, that was, you know, at the top of anybody's mind. Uh, it, it, I, I think that b when women started practicing law more, uh, and I think legal aid people becoming, you know, so inundated with uh, family law cases, people started understanding that, that that's an issue, or at least we were part of the coming to understand that. So, uh, and then as a, the consumer law, the collections cases, the used car cases, the new car cases that got us in such trouble in uh, 1982 uh, or 1980. And, uh, and also in the consumer area, the, the industrial insurance issues that uh, Margaret Bem and others uh, worked on. Well, uh, that, the, l let me interrupt you uh, there if you don't mind. If, if, if I recall that, that actually got on um, a national news program. Didn't yeah, it? Margaret. Margaret was on 60 Minutes uh, for for that. I mean, it was a pretty effective uh, sort of education thing and and legislative uh, work, calling to people's uh, attention uh, the abuses uh, in that area. And uh, you know, it was sort of a a uh, legislative advocacy and sort of community education. But this had been a, an issue for I, in, in looking back at some of these old things. There was an editorial in the Tennessean in 1973 uh, that was lauding the Housing Authority Board of Directors that saw the great problem of that industrial insurance, the people in the housing projects uh, that they were running, uh, getting, you know, in, taken in and some of these uh, industrial insurance things and so they voted to open a consumer advocacy thing so that had that that was an issue that was a, that that we sort of took up on behalf of some people who would come in our consumer you know to on consumer law so we got family consumer health I mean obviously access to health care uh, health bills uh, for things I mean there was another uh, thing where Baptist Hospital sued some client for uh, for their services, and the client obviously couldn't pay. You know, and they were going to you know take her home or garnish her check or do do whatever it was. And uh, you know, lawyers from our office defended her uh, in General Sessions Court. Uh, were unsuccessful uh, and appealed to uh, Circuit Court. Uh, and Judge Swigert, uh, after he heard the case, said, well, Baptist Hospital, do you, I mean, you're a charitable institution. Do you have a uh, charitable program here, to, to something set up to handle charity cases? And, and uh, if so, can you show that this woman wasn't, wasn't qualified? And so Baptist, at that point, dismissed the case. Uh, dismissed their lawsuit against their client and, and just sort of went on. But this is something we pursued, and it, that led to other problems with United Way. But uh, so we've got uh, family, consumer, health, housing. I mean, obviously, housing is an issue for poor people. Uh, landlord tenant issues, you know, and all, all the things, conditions, cases, and detainer warrants. And then benefits. I mean, things like SSI, Social Security, uh, you know, and, and all the all the other programs, the food stamps, and all the other programs that, that people have to deal with. So those are the those are the everyday things that we just sort of, you know, involved in all the time. 
Well, I know the, the case, uh, the demand for services is um, overwhelming, but I know that over the years you have worked out relationships with the Bar Association pro bono programs and law, <coughs> lawyer referral um, to take some of that excess. You, do, would you describe that relationship mm -hmm. with those programs? Mm -hmm. Um, the, the Bar Association has had a lawyer referral uh, program in place uh, for a number of years. Uh, and as I said, in, in years before there was legal aid, had, had their own sort of uh, legal aid program. And then in 1980, uh, and I think George Payne brought this up in a, in a bar board meeting, saying, you know, we ought to have a, a, uh, a uh, pro bono program, organized pro bono program, and, you know, that, that we could operate in conjunction with the lawyer's referral service. And uh, so uh, they, they formed a committee, and I don't remember everybody who was on the committee. I rem remember that now uh, Judge... Joe Haynes was on that committee and, and uh, several other people and, and uh, to study and, and I worked with them uh, and offered to you know, do the screening and, and help in any way we could and, and even to have it operate through legal aid. They decided to set up a separate uh, operation uh, at the lawyer referral uh, and did and the same person did both lawyer for only uh, pro bono for a while, and then they hired uh, a person I think specifically to do that. And that was Victoria Webb, and went along like that until I think '76. Uh, strike that '86, and uh, at that point there was the '86 or '87. Maybe it was '87. Maybe it was '88. But anyway, uh, uh, there was some discussion about uh, uh, they, the, the pro bono group was trying to raise money and Legal Aid was, was trying to raise money in a, a fundraising campaign. Um, and uh, there was some effort to sort of work this out and sort of bring it together. And really Jim Weatherly was, was the one who you know, just sort of took this on as almost a lifetime project, it seemed at, at the time that it went on for years and years, uh, the uh, negotiation and renegotiation and this and that and the other, uh, trying to put this thing together. Uh, but the long and short of it is that uh, I think in '88 or '89, uh, then the pro bono person from the bar moved over to legal aid. Uh, and uh, we started uh, administering uh, that together. Um, and uh, that brought all kinds of efficiencies. You see, we could, we could have one of our sections doing, uh, or all of our sections, doing the intake. And, and uh, for most of the case, there were some cases that pro bono lawyers handled that we didn't handle. Uh, and so we would do most of the intake and then the, the pro bono coordinator could then call and try to get the lawyers to, in the Bar Association who had signed up for pro bono uh, to do these cases. And we went along with that for a while. And then uh, I think mainly at the instigation of the pro bono board, it was decided that it'd be good to have a lawyer directing the, the pro bono program uh, and I remember Drake Holiday did that temporarily, and then we were able to hire uh, Lucinda Smith, who, who came on uh, and uh, began coordinating that uh, at Legal Aid. Now, in you, the, your long tenure at Legal Aid, what would you describe as uh, difficult moments uh, for the organization uh, along that, uh, mm -hmm. in that long period? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the struggle with the, the federal funding and the federal restrictions, I mean, it was just sort of an ongoing thing. I mean, 
uh, as I indicated earlier, I mean, the, the cuts in 81 particularly and uh, then in 94, 95, uh, the restrictions, they were always uh, getting added or taken away. And then, unfortunately, under the uh, Reagan administration, they, they, they tried to kill the Legal Services Corporation. And when they were unsuccessful doing that, uh, mainly, I, I think one of the leaders in the Senate was Warren Rudman from, uh, from New Hampshire, who, who really helped save uh, legal aid, uh, and you know, lots of other people, the, the uh, American Bar Association and, and all of it. So they were able to save the, the Legal Services Corporation, but the funding was cut and the administration installed a board of directors for that corporation that was opposed to what that corporation did. And uh, so you can imagine the, the harassment uh, that went on after that. Uh, and they had these federal monitors and inspectors general and all these people. One of the presidents of the Legal Services Corporation said, our job is to catch these people with their hand in the cookie jar. And so that was sort of their, their attitude uh, toward all of these local legal aid uh, organizations around the country. Uh, it was either that president or another one that later got arrested for shoplifting uh, in, in Fairfax. Uh, but, I mean, it was a rogues gallery up there. I mean, it, it was pretty difficult to deal with uh, on a local level. Uh, so that was, that was one of the bad things. And then, yeah, dealing with that with, with, uh, with an organization and with a staff, you know, not ever knowing, you know, what was coming next. and, and you know, the people just hung in there. I mean, just hung in there and did their job. And as they would form these doomsday committees and these millennium committee, you know, what are we going to do if? You know, if the funding's gone in six months, how will we handle you know, it? You know, and, and I think it was good that you know, everybody was involved in this, and, and, but it was certainly distracting uh, from uh, what we were trying to do. So that was difficult. And, and then the, the, I've alluded a couple times to the United Way thing, um, which uh, fortunately is, is dated. Uh, it's not the case anymore, I don't think. Uh, but we, uh, the legal services of Nashville f started getting funding from the local United Way in uh, 1972. And in 1973, there was somebody on the board of, uh, of the United Way who wanted to cut off our funding because Rita and Paul had filed a complaint in the Public Service Commission about a rate, opposing a rate increase that South Central Bell. Rita and Paul Geyer. Geyer. The lawyers. The lawyers. Uh, Rita is now with the Baker Center at the University of Tennessee. Uh, and, uh, and, they, so, so that came up. Then in 1974, uh, Commissioner Fred Friend uh, contacted the United Way and, and uh, said he, uh, that they ought to cut off our funding because we kept suing him. Uh, and uh, then in, in 79, uh, 78, 79, it was sort of a perfect storm. I mean, we were defending cases against banks, car dealers had filed this uh, defense against Baptist Hospital and, and uh, let's see, car dealers, banks, and hospitals. I, maybe that's it. But, but they were all putting pressure on uh, United Way to, to defund us. And uh, what the United Way decided to do was to cut our funding. And uh, to, I finally persuaded them that they could put their money into the family law section and uh, that we wouldn't hopefully be, you know, opposing people that, that uh, wanted to cut our funding that way. Um, and so, so they did that but conditioned it on, uh, on our using it for match money and a Title 20 grant that we got for family law. So, I mean, that was a, but, you know, in that, in that process, the person I remember who really, 
really was our champion and was on our board for 11 years, Joe Cummins. I mean, he in that case, and I mean, over the years, I mean, the, that whole episode from from uh, uh, 73 to the early 80s. Well, we've discussed some of the difficult times uh, for the uh, organization, but as uh, the, the director, were there times that were difficult for you personally? Well, always I mean, the personnel issues are always uh, a problem uh, and the, the feelings that go along with it. And, you know, frankly, the, the people that work for legal aid as lawyers and others are, are real attuned uh, to discrimination, whether it's uh, racial or gender or or the ADA, the Disabilities Act, um, and so those I have to say those those were some of the most difficult times personally, um, and the personal feelings involved. But I want I want to tell you a, a story about that. I had one one case where the employee or ex-employee. Uh, went and uh, was looking for a lawyer to, to represent uh, this employee. And, uh, and I got a phone call uh, in my office uh, on a speakerphone from uh, these two lawyers in a very nice firm, very good lawyers. Uh, and uh, they told me that they were uh, talking to this person and asked me a few questions. and, and uh, yeah, I, I talked with them, and then we uh, hung up, and, and I thought, oh boy, uh, this is this is really this is this is going to be a problem. And uh, I called Claudia Bonham, and I said, Claudia, who would you call at this at, at this point? And and she said, I'd call Bill Ramsey, uh, and uh, so I did, and uh, I called called Bill. And this was sometime in there in the 90s, I don't know what part of the 90s, but, uh, and uh, I called Bill, and Bill was so nice and so gracious and so uh, ready to listen and, and, and spent an hour talking with me on, on the phone and uh, he uh, said his firm would uh, represent us and, and, uh, and Ken Jackson ended up uh, doing much of the work on that and, and uh, the, the case was finally taken care of just just fine and my decision stood and all that kind of and so it, it came out all, all right um, but that was on a Thursday afternoon I mean this, the, the case obviously went on for months and months and months uh, but that was on a Thursday afternoon on Saturday morning I got up and looked at the morning paper and the headline there was about a lawsuit uh, that uh, that was to start in federal court on Monday morning over $25 million lawsuit. And the lead lawyer in that was Bill Ramsey. And here, four days before a $25 million federal lawsuit, he, was, he took an hour uh, and never mentioned to me that he was rushed, that he had anything else on his mind. And that always, to me, has been a sort of the benchmark of uh, a lawyer when needed and, and the, the, the willingness of, of so many lawyers to, to help people at, at times when they're pretty stressed out. Uh, and, and I just have always appreciated uh, Bill. Oh, there's one other time when I was talking about the headlines in the paper. This, was my, this must have been in the, in the early 80s. And I was not in town. I was out at the farm uh, doing something. I got a phone call from Austin Van Dross, uh, and who said to me, okay, where have you been holding out on us? Austin was on the staff at that point. I said, what, what, what is this all about? It's Sunday morning. And uh, he, he said, uh, well, the headlines in the paper said uh, the legal services director arrested for pot, and uh, that must be you. And 
it turned out that it was the legal services department of the legislature uh, who was arrested. But there I was, way out in Houston County, just doing nothing. Poor Dick Lodge got stuck with going on these radio programs and saying it, it wasn't Ashley, it wasn't, you know, and, and, you know, and I never knew anything about any of the confusion until I got back to town. Uh, that, that was not, uh, actually, that was not stressful. That was not a problem, but that just, I just remembered that uh, sort of interesting uh, part well, you, of the career. You told us about um, the, the federal government's uh, withdrawal of some financial support in proportion to the size of the organization. Um, and especially since this is a uh, interview under the auspices of the of the Nashville uh, Bar Association, tell us how the Nashville lawyers and lawyers in the surrounding counties uh, responded to some of the 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 financial needs of of legal aid. You know, as as difficult as the Reagan years were for legal aid um, and for, for all the, the loss of, of, of money and, and ability to do things, um, it really in a, in a way was a, was a blessing in disguise. The pro bono program is one example. The bar really stepped up and, uh, and got involved in that and, and started doing that in an organized way. Um, the other thing, uh, I mean, there were many things. I mean, the bar was so supportive in that. The judges were supportive. They, you know, everybody was contacting their legislators and it, it really uh, sort of brought together the, the support. It was very encouraging. And I, and I think really, you know, we had had some rough spots uh, in, in years before and I mean, this sort of brought us together uh, in, a, in a wonderful way. Um, and the other thing is uh, the, the fundraising campaign. Um, you know, we, we lost a lot of, lot of federal dollars and, and we needed to make it up. And, uh, you know, then uh, we started this fundraising campaign. Charlie Warfield was the first. And, Harris Gilbert was the second, and then went on, and and uh, and others have you know done such a great job uh, over the years. We started with a goal of fifty thousand uh, dollars, and we're going to try to raise forty thousand from the lawyers and ten thousand from the general community. May Shane was head of the community campaign, and we ended up with a goal of fifty, raising sixty-two. Uh, next year, the combined legal aid and pro bono campaign Harris he headed uh, raised 100000 And now, uh, you know, when I left, we were raising 700 and some thousand uh, a year. And it's, I mean, and it's so, that obviously a lot of people uh, in the bar and in the community uh, now have a big investment uh, in legal aid. And that, I mean, that just is so encouraging to the people who are doing the work to realize, you know, all of these other people uh, are, are being so supportive. And, it, and it's, uh, you know, one, it, the, the, the campaign has had wonderful leadership every year. Um, but in, I don't know, 94, 95, Jim Cheek headed the, the campaign. And Jim had two things that he wanted to see happen. One, he wanted to establish this uh, leadership council. He wanted to get the large law firms uh, to uh, donate a certain amount per lawyer. Now, this is in addition to individual gifts that we'd gone after. And uh, so he instituted this leadership cabinet that you, you know, the law firms could be in if if they gave $200 a lawyer uh, and recruited, a, I don't remember if it was 12 or however many law, law firms at that point, uh, to, to do that at $200 a lawyer. 
And, you know, some large law firms, that money really uh, adds up. Uh, I think it's now up to $400 a lawyer. Uh, and so that is a significant part of the, of the campaign. Uh, and it really formed. The other idea he had was to start an advisory council. Our board, again, because of federal restrictions, the, the, one of the regula federal regulations says that if we're going to take legal services corporation money, our board has to be 60% uh, lawyers named by the Bar Association and 33% people who are eligible for legal aid. Uh, so that, it doesn't leave you much room for just normal, everyday walking around people in the middle class and in the giving community uh, in Nashville. And so Jim's idea was to organize this advisory council, which then the next year, uh, Aubrey Harwell uh, did and got John Siegenthal up to head. And, and we formed this wonderful group uh, that uh, would meet quarterly and advise us on things like, you guys need a public relations firm to help you uh, with some of these things. And, and you know, it's just other common sense walking around uh, things uh, that gave us an expanded view of uh, what the possibilities might be for the organization. So a lot of, a lot of good things have come out of this campaign. Every year it's led by a lawyer, uh, and the Bar Association has been you know, very supportive and, and all that. So it's, it's been, it's, it's a wonderful uh, evolution of, of the organization in the, in the community. Well, here at the end of this interview, it's been very informative. Is there anything else that you'd like to say about um, legal aid or your long association with legal aid? Well, I mean, it's, it's just been a wonderful, uh, it, it's what I wanted to do when I went to law school. I got to do it. Uh, I got to live in Nashville. It was uh, just a wonderful place. I'd never been here before, and, and uh, we, we've just really loved uh, being here. And, and uh, Susan, as I say, taught at Fisk, and then after a couple of years came and taught at Vanderbilt and had a wonderful career there. And, and uh, so it's, it's just been a, uh, uh, you know, just an I, ideal situation, and, and to get to do this, uh, something that, you know, I sort of had a, a sense of even when I was in seminary, uh, has really been nice. And so that's, that's all I, except to say thank you for uh, doing the interview, and thank you to Gareth Aiden and the, the uh, historic uh, committee for uh, setting this up, and thank you for... Well, now, just for... for one more, one minute, you, you need to tell us uh, about your experience as a farmer since you, you've retired. <laughs> you, you live on a farm in Houston in, County, yeah. and how big a farm is that, and what uh, have you been doing as, a, <laughs> as an ex-lawyer farmer? Oh, that just, uh, it's, it's a wonderful life. It's on Yellow Creek, and... Uh, you know, it's a wonderful little hollow there, and and uh, we've got cattle that we raise, and and uh, they're it's it's the breed is Murray Grays. And Susan's father helped introduce them into this country back in the early 70s, and and he died in 75, but we uh, got some in the mid 90s, and and we enjoy raising them, and and uh, just. It's a great life being there. Both of our kids are here in Nashville. Uh, Carrie's practicing with uh, Baker Donaldson, and, and Matthew's uh, in this uh, wonderful position as director of uh, economic and community development, working with Mayor Dean. And uh, so, yeah, life is good. Life is good. Well, the historical committee of the bar wants to thank you for not only your service, but for your your interview and your contribution to our historical uh, library of interviews. Thank, Thank you. you.